um, I'll kind of go into official introduction and background as I go through the slides. Um, but I'm a little bit nervous, um, to be honest. And I can't wait to um, hear from everyone. My goal today is to kind of go through this presentation quickly. It just kind of goes through my background and um, how we brought our first product to life from digital to physical. And, um, but I would love to spend a good amount of time um, learning about where everyone else is at on their journey and some any specific questions or challenges they may be going through in bringing their digital visions, digital fashion designs um, into physical. And I would also love to know where everyone is tuning in from, maybe what city, what country, um, because I have no idea. Oh, wow. We are global. We are global in here. Wow. London, Nigeria, Stockholm, Tokyo, Greece, Miami, Berlin, Lisbon, Sao Paulo, Tokyo, Mexico, South Africa, Edinburgh, Italy, Venezuela, Finland. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, I will, yeah, super global. Um, I will preface that um, a lot of the tools and resources that I'm sharing um, are kind of US based. But again, once I have a better understanding of um, some of your challenges, right, because it might not be related to sourcing and finding suppliers and vendors, it might just kind of a better understanding of product development process. So um, I think I'm going to get started. Is that okay? Go ahead. I will go ahead and assume that you can see. Okay, so I want that this to be a workshop producing IRL, bridging the digital and physical in fashion. Um, so workshop description. This will be a workshop where we'll get an understanding of where everyone's at on their digital or physical fashion journey and what challenges they'd like to bring to the table to collectively solve. I'll be sharing my background and journey on bringing mirror works to life and the tools and resources I've collected along the way to share with you. My goal is that you will confidently walk away with the information needed to ignite action, bringing your visions to life, literally. And these are some cool, cool digital fashion designs that I found on the interwebs. Um, hello, next slide, please. Oh, oops. Um, some questions. Um, can I get, I guess, some sort of affirmative emoji, maybe like a hands, um, like a hand emoji, and I'll kind of go slowly. Has anyone here made physical garments before? One. I got several. Okay. And awesome. And then um, are you currently working on a project that you'd like to make physical? Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, awesome, 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 yeah. Okay, do you have industry experience in design or product development? This might be sketching, making tech packs, sourcing fabrics, sourcing trims, working across teams. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, perfect. Oh, yay, photo shoots. Um, and then I'm going to assume, are you currently designing in tools such as Browser, Clo, and Blender? Okay, we are working with, with some serious professionals here. Okay, are you currently utilizing AI tools like Midjourney to inform your design? Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes, yes. I'm getting a lot of yeses. Are your designs fantastical and more like hot couture? Some yeses, some yeses. Okay. And then are your designs more ready to wear or street streetwear, tailored? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In between. And Mary's. Okay. I guess it's subjective. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Um, so we'll spend the next 90 minutes or so covering the process, tools, and resources for developing physical fashion products from start to finish under the context of digital fashion and the Web3 ecosystem. I want to preface the workshop to highlight that this is but one approach to developing fashion products that is neither tried and true, no firm, and canonical. As many of the residents here are aware, fashion is quite a behemoth to hold, behold, a complex system with varying attributes depending on product category, fabrication, garment construction, supply chain logistics, pricing strategy, wholesale relationships, e-commerce infrastructure, and customer loyalty. This is not including all we're seeing today with digital fashion, digital twin avatars, metaverse experiences, NFC chip-enabled products, tokenized products, community, and NFTs. It's such a fascinating time for the industry where we get to witness a tectonic disruption in how we make, sell, and buy clothes. No economic forecasting or demographic trend can reliably predict where consumers will spend their attention and money, nor can we truly understand the impact of Web3 technology across every facet of fashion from design to delivery of product. Um, I'm truly excited and proud to be an active builder and participant in this space today. And while I can spend the next 90 minutes ranting about what's broken, my goal is for everyone to walk away with tools and resources to support you on your creative journey, merging digital and physical fashion to share across platforms. So my name is Joanne. Um, I landed in fashion by way of owning and operating a garment development and production factory in New York. I studied art history and literature at Hunter College and spent my career in the art world as a gallery director, curator, writer, and community organizer. My proudest achievement during that time was creating a group show with 50 plus artists working across mediums titled Irrelevant, Asian artists who don't make art about being Asian. It was really cheeky and it was fun. Um, after a few years witnessing talented artists being gatekept and dirty trading practices, I shifted industries into event production and organizing markets with creators, chefs, makers, artisans, and craftsmen selling their wares for the public. For months, I ran a market in the basement of a church in Brooklyn, which landed a story in the New York Times. We got shut down by the health department immediately. I met some of the most resilient, self-directed, and creative people during this time. I shifted careers again and supported my father, Johnny, factory operator and master pattern maker of three decades in the garment district. At Johnny's, we got to work with some of the most respected and prestigious brands for their runway and stores. Alexander Wang, Helmut Lang, Provenza Schuler, Philip Lim, Derek Lam, Prabhu Gurung, and dozens more entrusted us and our expertise to bring their designs to life. The teams behind these brands also often used our fitting rooms as a place of rest and reprieve from the chaos and toxicity that is common in this industry. I closed the business in 2018 and ventured into fashion tech, building so codes, which are data sets with symbolic outputs printed onto the seam allowance to prompt standard operational procedures for sewers to optimize for efficiency in a customized and modular production environment. That was hard, but fun. And these are an example of some of the cute little symbols that we created. Currently, I head the US office for a garment manufacturing company that services global brands in the technical outerwear and performance wear sector. They are also partners on a 3D fashion design platform currently in beta in Korea. The technology will enable creators of all types to design 3D without knowledge of software and directly connects the digital to physical with manufacturing capabilities. We do have a library of styles that service as blocks you can layer and build on top of for further design, 
printing, or manufacturing. You guys will be the first to know when we're ready. So late to the game, but in early 2022, I read an article about Digital Sneaker Collective Artifact being re required, that's funny, acquired by Nike and it all clicked. Many of the challenges faced by creators also meant that consumers were just that, passive consumers that were fed information and products in a market controlled by a few. Blockchain tech and in particular NFTs empowered both creators and consumers to create, contribute, distribute, own, and accrue value. In the context of fashion, this meant that there was a market for hyper-customization at scale that begins on screen and extends to a new way of engaging with physical products. Digital fashion is a nurturing, evolving, and swiftly growing community. We're familiar with how Fabricant, DressX, Dematerialize, and other platforms enable creators to launch digital-only fashion collections and monetize their creations in wearable marketplaces. We've seen big brands collaborate with NFT projects and platforms to test the waters and generate new forms of revenue. What have been some of the challenges um, in digital fashion today? So something for you to think about and share. Or I, present. Um, I can safely say fidgetal is a cringy word for many, and it perfectly represents new emerging models for value exchange. While metaverse, avatars, and wearables may take a while to reach mass adoption, there are tools available today that bridges the digital and physical fashion experience, all the while redefining the role of consumers from passive into invested collectors. The use cases today show success when applied using gaming mechanics and showing and systems with PFE, PFP collectors receiving token-gated physical products as a perk of owning an NFT. What additional paths can we, we create? The best example I've seen today of token-gated physical product in the fashion space is Tribute Brand's Odd Sweater Project. Odds are generative sweaters in collaboration with Waste Yarn Project and Chromie Squiggle. Each sweater is derived from on-chain source code of Chromie Squiggle, and each squiggle is transformed to generate unique physical and digital wearables linked to individual Chromie Squiggles, with each item being uniquely tied to its owner, but instantly recognizable as a one of one of X to everyone. Each sweater is made from available surplus yarns and equipped with NFC chips that connect to the tribute to serve as an authentication tool to the tribute app. Are there other similar projects you can share to think about? Uh... Sorry. There you go. So following the discovery of blockchain technology and NFTs in 2022, I joined Shifi. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Shifi, but it's an educational cohort that's women friendly um, to learn the mechanics of how this ecosystem works. In parallel, I'll bu I built a flow of how we can bring digital art and fashion to life. This was then applied to create the first product for MirrorWorks. Um, my collaborator, Veronica, um, attended Art Blocks Weekend in Marfa in 2022 and minted this beautiful artwork by generative artist Daniel Calderon called Marfa Yucca number 258. We chose a silk cam shirt silhouette and it served as the canvas that allowed us to deconstruct and re-engineer the artwork onto the garment. We worked with a pattern maker and 3D builder, her name was Lee, to render the shirt and experiment with artwork deconstruction and placement using browseware. The result was awesome. I'm very proud of our turntable.
relatively novel and difficult to execute or scale without some willing effort, we worked with digital printing company in Vogue Studio in the Garment District in New York to create a marker with specified artwork placement layered on top of the pattern. This is a rather big deal when thinking about the amount of fabric brands tend to waste in creating custom placements using fabric with an all-over print. It's a common wasteful practice, and it was a given for us to try engineering the artwork directly onto the pattern pieces. Because we were working on natural fabric like silk, the best method was digital printing. In Vogue Studio is a full service company that had high quality stock fabric and printers in house for us to print direct to fabric on site. We removed the marker layer so that only the artwork was visible and printed. After wash, scour, and dry, the fabric was ready to cut. We printed paper markers of the pattern to lay on top of the fabric and carefully cut the pieces of the shirt. For production, we graded markers with patterns specifically placed to match the printed fabric to ensure we were saving fabric and cutting at scale. We worked with Queen Studio, a factory in the garment district that has a flexible open door policy and who they work with. We're grateful for their willingness to test and experiment with us. And I think that's kind of a key in bringing your, your digital to physical is finding these um, partners um, that are willing uh, to work with you um, in creating these prototypes, right? Um, here you see Sifu, which means master in Chinese, who's an expert sample maker, skilled in constructed tailored wovens at the highest expected quality. He's the best. Part of our goal is to produce on demand with no inventory and be fully transparent about how many units are made of each style and connect that addition to its owner. We worked with NFC's uh, chip provider, Verify, to sew on ch chips to each garment, in this case it was hidden behind the chest pocket, programmed to verify ownership, addition, and authentication of each product. We wanted this shirt to be an edition of 55, meaning only 55 exist, and collectors get to see exactly which edition number they own. I, for one, um, for example, I own number one. The final product is an NFT artwork uploaded onto a 3D garment to then be printed, cut and sewn, linked and verified on chain. We were invite invited to pop up during NFT NYC, hosted by Web3 Commerce platform Dispatch. We produced a size run for display and sale and were put alongside some of the key players in the Web3 space today. That was a lot of fun. So what's next? What's next for us, for MirrorWorks, um, I discovered generative artist Luke Shannon's collaboration with Gucci where a coat pattern was used as the constraints to generate unique artworks. It opened my eyes to the possibility of creating a flow for generative fashion where each piece and artwork is a unique one of one that collectors can mint to add to their digital and physical closets. So as mentioned, this is one very specific way to approach turning a digital fashion item into a physical product. Whether you envision working in cotton, wool, recycled polyester, and the silhouette as a corset, a puffer, a tear gown, or cargo pants, you can find resources catered to your specific design. These are some of the resources I've discovered in my journey. For fabric printing and embroidery, Swatch on, um, considering this is a very global um, classroom, Swatch on, they are a company based in Korea um, and working with a lot of suppliers in Korea, but their platform is digital and they ship globally um, and they're they work with suppliers to carry stock items, um, low minimums. They have digital printing, sublimation printing capabilities, um, and they um, have a digital um, fabric library. So let's say you find a beautiful sequined neon pink fabric um, that is on stock. They will also digitize it for you so that you can dress your um, 3D render and your avatar. Swatch on is awesome. Um, 
Um, in Vogue Studio is local here to New York, and they provide digital printing and CAD design. Um, they're totally, they've been very flexible and open, um, and so might be worth contacting, and they will work with you online and ship to you, no problem. Preview Textile, um, it's always kind of important to work with, find suppliers, um, to do some research and find suppliers that have stock and low minimums. And so between Preview, Zentex, Car, um, they have all different types of fabrics that, um, that they also carry stock or have low minimums. They are suppliers and their inventory is um, between the US, Japan, um, and China for the most part. So they, they'll be able to ship globally. Um, Cornet Digital, um, they have um, vendors who utilize their printing machines, but it's digital printing without the use, uh, without the need to um, wash, dry, and scour. So it's print and then you're good to go. And I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, New York Embroidery Studio, also again, local to the US, but they work with some of the uh, best brands, all the brands in New York, um, providing printing and embroidery services. Um, and so they're used to, um, they're used to hard, complex projects. Um, and those are the kind of partners, again, that you would be wanting to find. Um, these are some resources for marking and grading and factories. Um, CFDA resource page is, again, pretty local to the US, but if you are able to find, I think the most important is to find a small business manufacturer who is willing to kind of hold your hand and is willing to work with you um, without a tech pack. I did none of this without a tech pack. Um, NFC chips, I've contacted and had conversations with many, um, but these were the two that I felt like were the most helpful. Um, I always look for you know good teams and good people. Um, Verify and IYK, they have some differences. Verify um, makes, uh, you have to download the app in order to see the metadata versus IYK is web-based um, and IYK will do all the programming for you versus Verify has a dashboard where you enter all the information um, such as your smart contract and your product descriptions, um, et cetera. Okay. I kind of breeze through that, but I kind of wanted to get that over with to learn about where everyone is. I guess first, any questions? And then if not any questions, I guess I would love everyone, I would love to hear um, everyone's project and maybe there are certain kinks or challenges that you're facing that we can kind of work on together. Hi, Joanne. May I ask a question? Hello. Hi. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> could you 
elaborate again on putting a product or a collection or like a series on the chain? Sure. Me, that's that's you know that's like the real innovation. I come from analog. Mm -hmm. I know how to head a production and all that stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Putting it on a chain is, you know, next level. Sure. I mean, the way that what, and same, I, I come from traditional and, you know, I kind of learned quickly over the last year what it means to bring anything on chain and why we want to do it in the first place. Um, the flow that I found made, that made most sense for, for me was to develop my own smart contract. And I guess I didn't mention that here. I apologize. Um, I used um, Manifold to create, and I'll kind of go over what that looks like. If I have that open. Um, but I used, I created a smart contract on Manifold. And what I utilized as kind of the image or the, you know, the quote unquote JPEG is the digital fashion product, right? It's the 3D render. So the 3D render serves as the NFT um, and the physical, you can only claim the physical um, by redeeming with the token. And the NFT, which is the token, um, is what's on chain. And then on the physical end, how do you connect it to the token is through the NFC chip. And the NFC chip, when you scan the, the product with the, with the chip, it connects it to the smart contract that shows um, verifiably that this is owned by this collector and this is edition number, et cetera, um, and any other metadata that you would want to connect. So essentially I use the digital fashion product as the NFT that links um, it to the physical using an NFC chip. I hope that makes sense. If not, please yeah, ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Great. What kind of capital one has to <laughs> in order to achieve a similar production? Um, <laughs> okay, yes. Um, this was, this was definitely bootstrapped. Um, this was coming out of my pocket, and it, um, and I was fortunate to have, to have worked with some of the creators and suppliers who were um, very flexible with their time and their energy, and so I can I can be very transparent. Um, I worked with a 3D pattern maker, but I feel like in this case, everyone is a 3D designer. So you don't have an issue creating this turntable that you see here, right? But I don't have that skill set. I'm not a 3D pattern maker. I'm not a 3D designer. Um, and so I worked with um, a 3D, uh, 3D designer and she was $75 an hour. Um, and uh, we went through so about three rounds. Um, and so you can, I think we spent, that was about $350, $400 there. Um, and the artwork that was minted, um, that was a free mint. So nothing went in there. Um, I decided to work with um, vendors and suppliers that I knew would be able to execute at high quality and um, and so the fabric itself was not cheap. I used 16 mummy, 100% um, crepe de chine, and it averaged about $32 a yard, which is incredibly expensive um, and not scalable if we were Zara. Totally doesn't make sense, um, but we're not Zara. And, um, and also we didn't have, um, we weren't ordering at bulk, and so, I, can, I, th I think I can break this down. I'm breaking this down right now into like the cost of each product. And so the fabric um, with the printing uh, included was about $32.
uh, a yard, and this takes about 1.2 yards. So it ends up being about, um, I think it ended up being about 40 something dollars per garment. Um, and then the cutting and the sewing was also not cheap um, because it was one at a time and it was in New York. Um, the cutting and sewing was $115 per product. I cut it myself because I, um, I otherwise, that it would otherwise have gone to $130. Um, and I'm not the best cutter, but it, it may do. Um, and then the NFC chips with Verify, um, it didn't cost anything. With IYK, it was $5 a chip. Um, and so I can say from the beginning of this journey to today, I spent about $600 on development and I spent about Hundred and fifty per garment, and I did make some inventory. I made thirty units total, and about eighteen or seventeen of them sold. Um, and I'm so I'm sitting on inventory um, because we want to kind of go to Marfa and sell them um, at pop ups, um, and so I had to pay that up front. So all in all, um, I shelled out about. Four thousand dollars of my hard-earned money, of my own um, sweat labor. Um, but a lot of, I think, it would have cost some more if um, I didn't have willing partners. Um, but it also would have cost less if I wasn't making a silk button-down shirt. This would look very different if I was making a T-shirt, which I don't know how many of us would be making T-shirts and screen printing on a T-shirt here. Um, and so let's say you have more complex styles, like um, I think I see a lot of um, anything more complex or more involved, like puffer jackets and um, gowns, you can expect to be paying a bit more for that. Okay, next question. I would love to know what programs you use and if you're not inclined towards production than design or is it a mixture of both? So the programs that we used for the 3D render was Browseware. Um, that we did not do any, uh, we didn't make this any prettier on, on Blender or anything. It was, this is just, what you see here is just out of um, Browseware. And Browseware in general is more manufacturing friendly than Clo. Clo is an amazing tool for fashion design. It's a terrible tool for manufacturing. Um, the files that get exported, many of the times the pattern lines get skewed and um, and it doesn't and the seam allowances don't export evenly. Um, so so Clo is an amazing tool for design, not a great tool for manufacturing. So browseware is better. Um, but we built this we built this body off of a sloper. Um, the cat the two d CAD software is Accumark. Then that 2D pattern was um, uploaded onto Browseware, and then we created the uh, we created the turntable um, on Browseware. We used Illustrator to deconstruct the artwork and lay on top of um, the 2D pattern, and that's all the software programs I think that were that were used. What are challenges you have faced coming into digital fashion scene from a traditional one? Um, have not seen that many of us yet and interested here more of our I think the only challenge is, is getting out of your own way. I think working in traditional fashion, um, when you're working behind the scenes, um, it's really, you know, it's, it's hard work and there's a lot going on if that's part of your job. Um, it, the only challenge is um, the willingness to be curious and open up mental space. Um, and I think that's honestly the biggest challenge. I think majority of people working in the industry um, don't have a lot of passion. And with passion comes curiosity and willingness to learn. I think honestly, that's the only challenge. Otherwise, um, if you're coming from the industry, you're at a huge advantage. 
because you have that know-how and you have that um, experience to then like be able to share it with with others um, and you only make the digital fashion space more wholesome um, by bringing your bringing your um, expertise into the space and I think everyone should be here in the space sorry next sorry my microphone has a problem but I have a question would you consider by creating digital twins selling physical products would have more promising customers as people buying digital only and have the knowledge of crypto are still limited. Um, yes and no. Um, I think we all have a pretty sensitive radar to um, um, ha we have a pretty sensitive radar to how um, virtual try-ons in comparison to physical um, items. The technology is not quite there yet. And for this to kind of reach mass, you need twins and avatars, metaverses and marketplaces to be kind of interoperable. So like if Michael Kors creates this kind of system versus Tommy Hilfiger, you know, you have to have two different twins and you have two different systems and filters that you're working through. Um, so that technology is very expensive and very clunky. Um, and I don't, we're not, we, I don't think the technology is quite there yet where you try on something digitally and you, you actually expect the physical to, um, to replicate that experience. Um, so that being said, um, I, I haven't been able to mention it here, but there's several different platforms um, and teams working on creating marketplaces and digital twins um, that links the digital to the physical and imagine a world where you know your your like digital twin your avatar is made to your measurements and like for shits and giggles like the face could be completely animated it can be an npc it can be you know an animate it can be some sort of pfp the face doesn't matter but the body is is actually measure is to, um, to your measurements, and you have an accurate way of trying on clothes, um, digital clothes across different brands, right? And they're kind of maintaining the integrity of anatomy and garment construction, um, and you can trust that you can your avatar is trying this on, and um, you will get the physical that gets shipped to your door actually um, matches and looks good. Um, that's actually coming. Um, it's coming very soon. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Uh, thank you for being transparent. And I think for everything included and the quality, that's a great number. Very awesome, thank you. Um, so interesting about browser and clothes manufacturing issues. Oh, yes, it's very, um, something that um, doesn't happen often um, because I come from the manufacturing side. Um, manufacturers don't often um, express or communicate with the brands um, the issues that they have on the pattern. Instead, they just kind of like shut up and fix it on their own. Um, and they do that by, um, because Clo and Browseware is kind of used universally as a product development, as like integrated into the product development cycle for brands. Um, they just don't use it, at, use it in this kind of context where it's like a digital, digital asset, right? Like you can sell it as an NFT um, and you can stylize it on Blender and you can animate it, etc. In the industry, it's kind of used as a product development tool and it's a pain in the butt to work with. And so it's great for design. It's great for the brand side, but for manufacturing, um, what ends up happening is they just export the DXF file and fix up all the kinks. And a lot of the times these tools aren't made, these softwares aren't made for garment construction. It's made for design. So oftentimes you'll have missing pieces, like it's, in, it's missing a facing, it's in, missing an inside waistband, it's missing a fly, it's missing all of these pattern pe um, pieces. Okay, and then, do you have experience of 3D printing fabrics? And would you have recommendations how to start studying this subject? I'm definitely in the man garment manufacturing, cutting and sewing expertise. I'm definitely not in the 3D printing um, uh, expertise, but I will show you 
by Bore is awesome and you can work with them. I haven't yet, but I'm really looking forward to working with them. Um, but they have 3D knitting machines and they've did some amazing um, collaborations. If you just kind of look through these guys, um, I'm, I'm really excited to work with them. That's one. And then um, 3D fabric is kind of really just, um, um, it's just 3D knitting. And you'll find, if you can find vendors who use this machine, it's 3D knitting. So it's seamless. And there's plenty, uh, there's a lot of venues that work with this. And traditionally, or not traditionally, 3D fabric making is, is more often than not, it's knit fabric and not woven. And, um, um, but that being said, if you go to some of these fabric shows, um, there is, I met one vendor who is working with um, recycled plastic bottles um, to create, to create uh, and, and we're not talking just like recycled polyester that just comes in rolled, rolled fabric form, but it actually, um, same thing, seamless um, garment making from straight from raw fiber. Um, so that I think is coming soon. I hope that answered some of your question. Um, Joyce, I have a question. I'll unmute. Please unmute. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Your presentation was awesome. Um, yeah, really, really inspired and very thorough. Um, oh, and awesome. yeah, thank, thank you for your transparency because I think many of us on the call are on different sides of the coin. Um, mm -hmm. I do come from an analog background and um, spent the last two years looking at the digital side. So seeing you explain on both sides is magical. Thank you. Yeah, I have you. Um, three quick questions was how do I, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. How do I, um, how do you work out the sizing aspect? Because you said that yeah. you manufactured 30. Um, mm -hmm. That was an uh, interesting point. And yeah. then um, what was your pricing as in like your retail oh, sure. price because you explained your, your costing oh, for sure. and yeah and then the third one is like what types of people bought your um your yeah. work because yeah, yeah these are very interesting points yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah absolutely um so for the the cut ticket or like what what cut what did i cut across sizes i generally use i think standard industry is using the bell bell curve model um, overall, you're going to, between, um, for women's, you generally sell um, size smalls and mediums. And then in men's, you generally sell most um, size mediums and larges. So if I'm cutting, so for a um, unit of 30, I cut few extra smalls. I cut few large, extra large, extra, extra large. But, and I cut majority size smalls and mediums. and because my shirt is unisex, it's developed in a, on a men's body, but it's trimmed shorter, so it sits a little bit cropped. So for men, it, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's a little sexy for a guy. You know, it, has, it takes a certain guy to wear a silk shirt. Um, but um, majority of my customers were women, um, and they bought mostly size smalls and mediums, and everyone wore it differently. I mean, I think, Fashion, in the end, it doesn't matter what the product is. It's what you do with it. I think it's what you, how you style it. And so um, I found that a lot, of the, a lot of people who bought were women and they wore kind of open shirt and they wore something underneath. Um, and so this, obviously, this would look very different if it was a garter, um, garter piece or like a very tailored, um, slim fit, woven, non-stretch product. But in general, for women's, you cut more smalls and mediums. Um, in men's, you cut more uh, mediums and larges. And then the price point was 0.2 ETH. You only, you can only have, you were only able to mint um, and purchase um, if you had a wallet and if you had ETH. And 0.2 ETH today, I think is 300 something. Um, yeah.
believe it was 300. It fluctuates, yeah. So it was anywhere, it, it reached 350 at some point. Um, but we can, if, if, you know, ask questions if you um, wanted to hear more, but the biggest takeaway for me in um, testing this flow and creating this product was around purchase flow and um, the end use consumer or the customer or the collector. I spent a, many months kind of racking my brain around, um, are you my customer? Are you my collector? How do we engage with each other? How much time do I require of you? Um, considering your, your, this is a new experience for you as the collector and consumer, you're buying a digital fashion product um, and it's sitting in your wallet, now what? Like how many times are you gonna tap the chip on your shirt to go show off to your friends that you have a token gated product, like who cares? Um, and that these are questions I kind of have nightmares about, to be honest. Um, and so, you know, what I've learned was that um, because I fell into the rabbit hole of Web3, specifically into the generative art community with art blocks, um, which is a, a very beautiful, safe, um, kind community to be part of. And then there was kind of the general Web3 crypto community that was um, like female facing between Shifi and some other communities like FWB and, um, and uh, Boys Club. And so amongst that, those were kind of the communities that I didn't like intentionally or explicitly target, but because this was Web3 native, because you needed coins, or sorry, because you needed ETH, um, that's kind of who I was marketing. Um, and I want to change that um, for moving forward. I want my cousin um, who doesn't give a shit about crypto and digital fashion. I want my little sister, I want my aunt, I want my friends outside of this space. Um, I want them to buy my shirt and they don't know, I don't, and it's okay that they don't know and they don't have to care. Um, what the technology that is behind it. What they're buying into is, I think, more the mission and ethos behind um, why I'm doing this anyway, which is, um, this is my way of disrupting the industry. This is my way of being transparent um, about how we design, make, and sell products. This is my way of being sustainable. Um, and... Um, and this is my way of um, hopefully informing and consumers to kind of more informed collectors. And I think it's worth the effort considering how much waste is out there. This is just one way. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Do you think using digital fashion will become mainstream for production in the next few years or not with the manufacturing challenges? Um, it's already... For, I think I mentioned like on, from the brand, corporate brand and brand perspective, it's used regularly in the product development cycle. It's just not used as a marketing asset and, you know, it's not um, dressed up to be shared on social media. If you look at performance brands, um, it happens, they use a, a, a tag or a lot of performance brands, um, cycling and um cycling and um, running, um, this is all rendered in Clo. They use, they use this as part of their um, e-commerce um, marketing. They just don't use it. They don't use it in the same context of digital fashion, right? But technically this is digital fashion. If you look at it, right? It's the same upload and download of um, artwork files. Um, and Hello. I, oh, hi. Yes. Sorry. Hi. I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up question. This has been yes. amazing. Thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared. Um, so do you think that creating rendered files like this and encouraging Web2 brands to show their products in this way is probably one of the quickest ways to onboard Web2 brands into the Web3 space without kind of scaring them, but then also using like Clo and totally. digital fashion and doing it totally. that way? Totally. Okay. I mean, I think I think brands... So again, performance brands, activewear brands, they already do this, right? Like you see this mm -hmm. here, I can, there's like so many websites, so many um, 
direct to consumer and wholesale brands that utilize 3D today, right? It's so, I think it's silly that um, brands otherwise don't. I think where the challenge becomes is not so much the digital fashion, it's the monetary exchange. Um, and so I think there's, it's still nascent, but, and it's, it's too hard for brands to do on their own because you need to hire developers and engineers and you need to okay. inter integrate your existing e-commerce with, and your entire like ERP system with, um, with it, this new way to, um, engage with your consumer. I think it's less about digital fashion. It's more, it's more about value exchange and, and like the monetary exchange, but there's already like, um, there's crowd muse and they do crowd muse is like good with mu um, music, but I know that they want to do a lot more with fashion, but mm -hmm. a lot of the limitation is, is I don't know what an NFT is. I don't fucking care. Um, <laughs> I don't have ETH. I don't want to make a wallet. What do you mean MetaMask? What do you mean connect? What? Um, a lot of that you kind of have to get rid of. And I know that there's a lot of um, companies doing that um, where you can have a digital fashion product and you can monetize on it using US dollars and you can do it, you know, integrate it directly into your website, into your Shopify. There's, there's a lot of solutions out there. It's just you just got to dig in a little bit and because that's what i faced as a challenge was um i was turning away people who were interested but didn't interested in the shirt but w were didn't didn't have a wallet and didn't have ethereum and they just were totally turned off by that mm -hmm. okay that's really really helpful thank you yeah of course but crowd news i think is also um they're in the CPG space as well. Something definitely to check out, worth checking out. Um, and then what advice would you give someone looking to start a digital fashion brand? What advice would you give? Ay, ay, ay. What advice would you give someone looking to start a digital fashion brand? What advice? Hmm. Um, it's, I think, it does, it does come down to money. Everything, is, everything else is figure outable. You just have to be prepared to spend and start with one product at a time. And that's what I did. I definitely could have you know, launched a whole collection with multiple looks. But um, really, I think focus on people and the teams, less the technology, um, because it's the people who help you um, see your vision through. It's not the technology. Um, and so wherever, whatever it is, that's your weak spot. So like maybe you're a 3d designer, um, and you need help with, but you have no idea where to start with sourcing fabric. Like I think figure out what your weak spot is and, um, find people who can help. I am always, I have a pretty hefty Rolodex of people who are, um, who are skilled across different, um, across different skills and they, they're all beautiful human beings that are willing to help. Um, so I think um, understand where you need help, understand your weak point um, and be, do the research in whatever locale you're in, um, find the seamstress, find the factory, find the locally, local um, fabric um, supplier and kind of start there before, like something I've learned is that it's actually, especially if your intention is digital, um, start with the fabric, start with the fabric, um, design against the fabric um, as like a sketch and then go into 3D, sell that 3D or digital um, fashion as your asset um, and then make the, make the physical. But it really helps, I think, to understand what your fabric is because it defines the personality and the voice of your product um, when you're going into that digital route. Um, hopefully that helped. Wow, so excited. What are these marketplaces? Um, yeah, nothing is like really like coming automatically into my mind, but um, the ones that I that are being built right now, I can't say, but um, they're coming soon, um, early next year and I will make sure to share it 
here in this Discord. Um, if you're a digital fashion designer and want to create your first digital twin, what are the technical points we should be aware of in terms of Pantone colors, for example? Sometimes the suppliers don't have our specific color, or maybe we need to follow a specific Pantone color grading. We'd love to hear more about it. Yeah. Um, everyone works differently. You can, um, I've definitely sent files um, for, so if you're talking about color, it depends on the printing method and it depends um, on the output, but um, if you're digital printing, sublimation printing, um, you can definitely just send the Illustrator file and they follow, they follow the color index of the artwork in that file. If you're, um, if you're looking to, instead of printing and you're talking more like you're dyeing fabrics um, and you're, um, you're weaving um, because you're, using with, you're working with a knit, um, you can request strike-offs um, by giving them a standard using exactly what you mentioned, in, um, using Pantone. But it depends. If you want to give me a little bit more context, I can, I can um, help you answer that question. But there's also like a pretty toxic process around um, color matching as well. Um, so much waste goes to bulk production being um, rejected because it didn't match a stupid Pantone color. But anyway, that's TMI. Um, some good example during Lushing L Digital Twin. Oh, let's see. Oh, yes. I saw, um, I think her name is Louise. I scheduled a call with her for next week. I am very, very excited to meet with her. And I believe this is the, oh, I don't have Instagram. The machine that they're using, I mentioned, is um, Cornet Digital. And so this, what I mentioned with the PDF marker, you really can only do this with digital and sublimation printing where um, instead of, okay, I'm just gonna, actually I'm babbling, I'm gonna stop. Um, yeah, this is, I'm really, really excited to learn more about Fidgetal Twin. Super exciting. Um, do you by chance know of any manufacturers who work in 3D printing, such as jewelry and accessories kind of manufacturer? It's been hard to find at least. More. I don't actually. Um, 3D jewelry and accessories. No, that's definitely not my, um, within my domain expertise. It's not in my rabbit hole, I'm sorry. Um, Coco, I have a question, please on you. Hello, um, thank you for Hi. coming on here today. Your presentation has been great. Um, awesome. It's really thank cool you. to see your work. Quick yeah. questions. Um, the first is, did you encounter any people um, that were perhaps uh, interested in, or I guess considering the fact that you're producing potentially one, on, one of one pieces or very limited uh, mm -hmm. capsule collections, that by owning the digital asset, it gives you the right to, I guess, mint quickly um, a few times or infinitely in case anything would happen to the physical product because i've seen a few cases in which since it's a very rare item um it kind of backs up as as like a digital mm. physical insurance in case anything happens to the physical product no um no because then it um no, because it then defeats the purpose of it being this rare, unique one of one, right? Here's a unique one of one, but just kidding, we do have a backup. Um, I don't, yeah, it doesn't resonate with me to think to do that um, because um, it de to me, it defeats the purpose of it being one of one, whether on chain or not. Um, and, um, yeah, the, it being on chain, it's, it's essentially your kind of, um, it's the appraisal, right? It's a certificate that proves this is one of one, which means there is no replica. There, it means there is no backup. Um, and, I, and, I treat, and I treated this initial product very much the way I, you know, I kind of functioned in the art world. It's like, here's the provenance of this artwork that I'm selling to you for a quarter million dollars. 
um, imagine like, you know, you, you're the sole owner of this sole painting, but you know, we have a backup just in case. Um, yeah, that doesn't, um, that doesn't sound right to me. Yeah. Yeah, that, makes, is that. that you, makes you, sense. You own this one and you better take care of it because there's only one of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the mm -hmm. second question really quick. Um, have you considered ever uh, potentially on that same, the same information that the NFC chip displays, um, integrating any potentially like supply chain information about the absolutely. product sourcing um, and do you see any viable ways in the future of manufacturers potentially putting yes. up that information for, for the product in a way that's um, not, um, man, that, that, that's completely transparent on chain and they can't manipulate or greenwash that information. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So it depends on the scale of the manufacturer, the time and willingness. So like mom and pop shops, um, they don't have the time, um, you know, to be measuring to the last minute and to the last drop, to the last electric usage. Um, they, you know, they're barely getting by um, kind of meeting their payroll, rent and taxes. Um, but um, I think it's, it's too much to ask for that from mom and pop factories. But when you look at, um, I'll give you my day job as an example. So where I work is here. It's a um, Korean manufacturing company that has facilities throughout Indonesia and Vietnam. And you know we do we work with global brands like mostly in the outerwear and athletic wear performance wear space. So we work with North Face, Adidas, Nike. Um, and Lululemon, Athleta, Kathmandu, Wagner, Moose Knuckles, etc. They're a, a publicly traded company in Korea. They're one of the like they're one of those big, huge manufacturers that you know we all kind of poo poo on a little bit. But um, they, so you know, the reason I joined this company was I kind of am aligned with what their efforts are and. This is where blockchain becomes, it kind of puts the two, it brings the two together. Um, so they have an entire team of engineers that connects, for example, smart sensors to these machines um, that will um, capture um, any, everything from just what orders are coming in, who's doing what, how long does it take, how much electricity are we using, um, and then that, and that's let's say just for like the cutting and sewing process. And under that umbrella, you have embroidery, you have heat seam sealing, you have down machines, filling, etc. And then in the fabric component, you have sensors that measure water consumption, um, electric consumption, and then energy use as a facility as a whole. And so our facilities all have um, uh, all have. Um, panels, sun, sun panels um, on the roof. And, but I don't know today accurately how much of that is used towards um, energy. Are we, is 30% is of our power coming from the sun or 5%? We have no idea yet. So that's kind of what um, we've been working with um, the Ministry of Culture actually in Korea and Seoul University in Korea. Um, majority of the engineers that are, um, navigating our facilities, our students from Seoul. And so it's totally possible, um, but in my mind, it, that kind of, um, so number one, it's totally possible that blockchain technology, when you tap on an NFC chip, it can accurately um, and live on like in real time, it can tell you all the metadata that you didn't know you wanted, you didn't know that you needed, that you might not care, but it's good to know that it's there, that this much water was consumed, this is the person who made my product, this is where it shipped from. Um, and these are things I'm actually more passionate about. Um, just, I don't get to talk a lot about it because I don't think a lot of people are interested, um, but it is totally possible. But that kind of innovation and willingness 
Manufacturers don't do it today because nobody's asking, really. Um, you get the greenwashing. Greenwashing happens because um, con the brands are pressuring manufacturers and the quick solve is to get third party um, inspectors like Bureau Veritas and Intertech to come in and like, you know, audit some samples and interview some people, but it's honestly complete bullshit. Um, the only way I think that you can really, the pressure to um, reveal that kind of information from manufacturers honestly has to come from consumers, not from brands. Today it comes from brands. Um, consumers don't care enough. Okay, you know, are you willing to pay premium for 100% um, sustainable recycled product? Yes, there are people, but not enough. Um, but it is possible. Sorry, I rambled. Thank you for that. That was really helpful. Yes. Um, I think 3D printing is pretty cool. Um, okay. Any other, I mean, I'd love to know, maybe, I don't know if we're allowed to, or maybe you can like just, can we share maybe like links to what everyone's working on? Um, and then, I mean, I'd like to, I'd love to see like one person project that they're working on specifically. I don't know if like people are allowed to take turns sharing screens if everyone, if anyone would be interested in doing that. Um, but I'd love to see what, what you guys are working on. And then if there's any other questions. Okay, you can't, so everyone, everyone can share screens. How'd the stream go? Ooh, arts thread. Ooh. Maybe I'll share my screen just to kind of show, share with everyone. Interesting. This is cool. What is going on? Super cool. Something I learned is that um, there's an excess of algae that gets um, by the ton, by tons that kind of come offshore. And you can, there's um, several labs and scientists and teams working on turning them into fabric, which I think is super cool. We have an excess of it, especially in South America. Oh, yay. Okay. There's anyone else? Oh yeah, I'm would love to see more algae stuff. 
Amazing. Yeah. Let's make fabric out of algae, guys. Do it. Super cool. Okay. I think we will wrap up here. If any last minute questions? If not, I loved um, getting to share my journey and process with everyone here. Um, I look forward to, oh, you guys can feel free to reach out um, for any support, questions, resources um, you may need. I help brands and work with brands and designers all day. So um, please reach out. F please feel free, feel free to ping. I think I can sign off here now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um yeah, you guys can I I honestly don't like Discord. Um so my Twitter, I'm going to enter my Twitter here, 00 mirror works. Is it? I think I think this is my Twitter. I think that's my Twitter. Um oops, I spelled I spelled it wrong. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for your kind words too. I'm also kind of on the lookout for um, generative artists who are um, familiar, I mean, are just kind of, they're knowledgeable in generative creative coding um, to work on my next collection. So if you want to maybe work together and you're a generative coder, um, please ping me as well.